How interesting is this, right? <laughs> this is uh, a lot of fun, and I appreciate everybody, like Blake said, with so much grace and so much forgiveness for what we're actually going to try and attempt to have a conversation in the midst of one of the most complicated spaces uh, we have been in as a human race. But I just want to start out with probably the most important fact. Um, in order to reach for the toilet paper over the top, you have a dominance on your pec muscle, your anterior and lateral delts, and your bicep, which actually allows you to more easily grab the toilet paper if you go under. It's actually inefficient from a musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal standpoint. So I appreciate what Blake is saying, but efficiency is actually tied to muscle use and effort, and it's going to be easier for you to retract that paper than it is to go under and pull it. So it's just science. you got to go over the top, and I apologize for anybody who's under. Um, it's just not true. It's okay. So... Um, that being said, I just want to start off this digital conversation and this virtual conversation with everybody uh, by pointing out, it's not even an elephant at this, at this point, I think it's another planet sitting on top of another planet, uh, of how complicated and challenging and difficult the spaces are that we're all in at the moment. Uh, each of us, respectively, are going through something that none of us have ever gone through before uh, in this particular space. So my goal for this conversation uh, is, look, I cannot boil the, in the in the 20 minutes or the 22 minutes, if, if Blake's going to let me go over just a touch. Uh, I can't boil the ocean in terms of resolving your pain or giving you something that's going to fix everything that you're going through. The biggest thing that I'm looking for in this conversation is just to give you some, some, some ideas, some ways to imagine new spaces, to practically apply that, just to give you a couple of key words that you can hang on to and go, how does this apply in my relative experience with what I'm currently going through? So here's the request that I have up front for you when we talk about this. Don't actually take notes, okay? I know this, this sounds counterintuitive, but when you are hearing this information for the first time, I want you to be exposed to it, but I don't want you, I don't want you to worry about integrating it or digesting it just yet. I use what's called the rule of three. The first time that you hear it, just let yourself be exposed to it, see what resonates. Go back if it's important to you. Watch it again to digest it. Go back a third time to integrate it. Uh, so what I would like you to do is if anything that I say lands with you, if it feels applicable, you're actually going to feel it in your body first, right? You're going to catch your breath, you're going to nod your head, you're going to feel it in your body with a heart rate change. Your body is going to react faster than your cognition even understands how to. So if I say something to you and you're like, man, that's for me, jot that note down, but otherwise just sit present and be connected with the conversation, throw something in the chat for Blake, and we'll see what questions we can answer at the end. Cool? Okay. So everybody take a deep breath. Let's jump in. Okay, first thing. That is not my picture. Bottom arrow. User error. Hang a picture properly. I'm also learning how to use uh, a keynote forward or PowerPoint presenter, so I appreciate your patience. This is the first thing that I just want to land the plane with in terms of conceptually for the conversation around identity. Look, we're in a place right now where I'm sure that all of us are asking, who am I in the midst of all of this? What version of me shows up in, in the midst of every 24 hours, it feels like the landscape is changing significantly. Right? How many of us have had a tectonic shift in our experience? There's been an earthquake come through our entire lives and disrupted what we've been experiencing. So how do we practically figure out who we are in these places? Who we are in relationship to our own lives, the lives of those that are close to us, that we are not used to having in our household all day long, and the communities that we normally engage with. Uh, so my work and the concept that Blake mentioned just a bit is about 10 years ago, I got introduced to this thing called the Enneagram uh, by a good friend of mine, Sean Champ Smith. And the very first time that I got exposed to it, I realized, you know, this feels a lot like brain function. It feels a lot like the basics of the way that we operate as human beings. But there's no resources on the neuroscience of it. So for the sake of this conversation, I'm not going to go into a ton of Enneagram language. There are so many good resources that exist around that. One of the things that you can get online and you can do locally is there's the International Enneagram Association. Their Georgia chapter, which is at ieageorgia.com, is a huge help for some of their local resources that you can connect with. For the sake of this conversation, what I want to be able to do is just give you a couple of keywords that are related to how we function as a human being from a brain standpoint, from a relationship standpoint, from an integration standpoint, and also connect that as we get to the end of the conversation with where those live in each number. So stick with me. 
I'm not going to go through Enneagram language, Enneagram language up front, but we will get there. But this language, more than anything, I want you to realize, is available to all of us. This is not a conversation about utilization. It's a conversation about capacity. So a lot of us in this space are asking, what am I capable of? I don't know what I'm capable of in this space. But I want you to first and foremost understand that every word that I'm going to go through, every piece of language that we're going to touch on, is naturally hardwired in who you are as a human being. When you have to reach over the top of the toilet paper and you know that you've got to use your shoulder, that's something that Blake might have to practice a little bit more regularly that he's not used to. But the reality is he's got it. I believe in him. He's got the capacity. He's just not using it on a regular basis. You see what I'm saying? So all of these things are naturally available to you. You just may not be using them regularly. Fair enough? Okay. Let's take another deep breath. Also realize I'm going to talk fast because we've got to fit a lot in. I hope that's okay. Because if this matters enough to you, go back and watch it again. If it doesn't, just go with whatever sticks for you that's relevant for today. Cool? Okay. So, here is the first thing that we are looking at. This is a concept that is really important. This is the idea of not, a, it's not about being less broken. It's a conversation about becoming more whole. And I want to give you guys the, the, the appreciation that this is not me saying that through all of the things that have happened in our lifetime of lived experiences, but also even in the last two weeks, uh, I think each of us are experiencing our own degree of brokenness, our own degree of hope deferred, our own degree of heart sickness, and our own degree of anxiety and panic and all of these things that have happened. When Humpty Dumpty gets broken, you wonder how to put it back together. The concept that I want you to think through is there's a really beautiful image called kintsugi, which if you Google it, it's Japanese pottery, where they intentionally take this beautiful piece of pottery, they break it, they put it back together with gold. So the next part, the broken pieces that are put back together, are actually stronger and more beautiful than the original piece that was made. The reason I say that is you're talking to somebody who became a doctor because I couldn't find a good one. I went to 21 specialists over nine years, averaging over 100 full-blown migraines a year, and I still do, unfortunately, trying to get answers about what does it look like to just be some incremental measure of health here because I don't know if wholeness is ever in the cards for me. I don't know if with the structural abnormality and the plumbing issues that I have in my brain, I don't know if wholeness is something that I will ever arrive at. But I would like to try and get out of bed or at least be motivated to get out of bed by not continually being reminded of what my deficits are. None of us are in a place right now where we need to be reminded that things are difficult. That's a given. None of us need to be reminded that there are things that are missing. That's a given. So we don't need to have a conversation for your brain to actually pursue some degree of survival. It has to believe that there are life-giving possibilities, life-giving opportunities, ways to minimize and mitigate threats. So it's not about being less broken. It's about becoming more whole as an active practice. Journey over destination for my Brandon Sanderson fans. So what we're going to do is talk about a couple of different words. I'm going to give you nine particular words that we're coming up with. These words, again, to reinforce this, are available to everybody. So what I want you to think through as we're going through each of these words is what is your initial reaction to the word? Does it feel life-giving? Does it feel approachable? Does it feel like something you want to pursue? Or does it feel a little uncomfortable? Does it feel like something you don't have a lot of familiarity with or you want to distance yourself with? It's going to be different for everybody, but I want you to understand all of these are naturally available to you. It just depends on your personal lived experiences, moment by moment, even in the last two days, what version of you shows up when this word pops up, okay? So the first word, deep breath, is growth. So what do I mean by growth? When we look at being able to use our body to actually grow a muscle, to grow a body, to grow a brain, I want you to understand that there is no more powerful educator on the planet than pain. If that pain is reconciled and made meaningful, there's no greater educator. Because if I go into the gym, which I'm 280 pounds, six foot two, I have not been on the in the gym on a regular basis. I actually break a sweat just driving past gyms and make me a little bit nervous. But my older brother is jacked. He's a big dude. He's got a lot of muscle mass. But I can promise you when you're growing a muscle, you're going to deal with your own degree of tension, your own degree of discomfort. And how many of us over the last couple of weeks have been stretched beyond what our normal capacity is? 
So when I talk about growth, I want you to understand in order to grow anything, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, or spiritually, you have to be stretched outside of your normal comfort zone. If you don't do a workout that breaks a sweat, you haven't done anything effective. If you do a workout and you are not sore for a few days afterwards, that workout did not stretch you. Now the beautiful thing is, because a lot of us, especially in the Western culture, especially in the US, are under the impression that we've got to make all of this work, that I've got to resource everything, that I've got to have all of the answers. The reality is when you stretch a muscle and you get those microfiber tears in the muscle, your body is gifted at naturally resourcing and healing you, whether you want it to or not. It's a byproduct of being human. So this is a point that I want to take away for growth specifically. The human race is more resilient than we ever even could consider giving ourselves credit for. And resilience for me, the definition of resilience is knowing the difference between discomfort and trauma. And I want you to hear me on this. If the only thing that we get through this conversation is what it looks like to grow in the midst of discomfort, the difference between discomfort and trauma is the length of time for recovery. So one of the most important things that we can do in the space that we're in at the moment is acknowledge there are going to be traumas. There are going to be traumatic experiences. How do you differentiate between what's uncomfortable and what's traumatic? If it hurts for a week or less, it is not a trauma full stop. If you run out of toilet paper, it is not going to be a trauma, okay? If somebody in your family passes away, that's a trauma. If you close a business, how many of our friends have had to lay people off? I'm in East Atlanta Village and one of my friends, Nolan, who runs Banshee, him and Katie, they've had to close. They're figuring out how to do to-goes and so many people are. There are going to be events that take us longer than a week to get over. But when we're looking at facilitating growth and understanding our own growth, one of the healthiest things that we can do when we don't feel like we have some sense of orientation or grounding to what we're experiencing is to at least quickly take a snapshot of the current thing that's bothering you and go, can I get over this in less than a week? If you can, it is not a trauma. Tell yourself that. It is something that's uncomfortable, but it will not kill you. And I also wanna point out here just as a disclaimer, this is a great time, thank God this is happening in 2020. Look at what we're doing with live streaming. Thank God this is an opportunity where you can connect with a licensed professional counselor or a marriage and family therapist or a spiritual director or a life coach. Connect with a positive, healthy, neutral sounding board that you can talk to through these things because therapy, if you are in fact in a traumatic space or even therapy as you're trying to determine that is accessible to you through telehealth more so than it ever has been, okay? So growth is something naturally available to you, but don't think because you're hurting that you're not growing. Right? We're going to speed up here a bit because I went a long, long time on that, but it's important. Next one is going to be rest. So here's a fascinating thing. How many of you feel like you're resting on a regular basis while you're stuck at home? Most of us are actually not feeling rested at all. But how many of us, if you had asked us a month ago, man, if you could go home and spend the entire week at the house, how rested would you feel? Everybody would be like, a week off to just sit at home? Man, I'd feel super rested but now we're in the context of it, I want you to understand there's a huge difference between sleep and rest. Sleep is involuntary. You do not choose to go to sleep. In fact, when you stop trying is most of the time when we actually effectively fall asleep. But rest is something that you do that takes intent. You have to choose to switch off. So I want you to understand when you're looking at rest, the easy way to understand what rest looks like is take a snapshot and an audit and an inventory and say, how many things do I have that are a stimulus? If I'm watching the news over and over again, or I've got notifications on my phone that are popping up every time somebody makes a tweet that either feels life-giving or makes my blood boil, right? How many times are you getting an input throughout the day that's causing you to stay engaged and to stay awake? Rest is that chance to just step back, shut down for a bit, and intentionally catch your breath to say, what does it look like for me to maybe bring the noise down? Really helpful resources are apps like Calm and Headspace but rest is something we have to actively, intentionally do. It is not hibernation. It is not disassociation. It is intentionally choosing to bring the noise down. Agency. The next thing that you have available to you is agency. And agency by definition is something that you advocate for. I mean, look at what Matchstick does and what Blake and Craig are doing with their company. It's saying, you have an idea. What does it look like? 
How do we make your message work? How do we make sure that people understand what your services and your offerings are? Who are we advocating for and what are we advocating for? Great example of this is look at what Terrence Lester is doing with Love Beyond Walls this week. If you need an example of what to do in the middle of a crisis, look up what Terrence is doing with Love Beyond Walls. It is profoundly life-giving. That's really good news if you guys want to see what to do and you're like, I have no idea how to engage in this space. Watch what he's doing. But the reason I say this, and we're going to come back to this at the end of the talk, is part of these words that we give you is helpful to understand what is the subject matter that matters during the conversation around these words. Who are we talking about? If I talk about agency, watch how much the tone of the conversation changes when I say, what do you advocate for in the big picture? How do you advocate for those that are within reach? And when's the last time you advocated for yourself? There is a very big difference between global advocacy, local advocacy, and internal advocacy for yourself. But agency is available to you. The question is, what is your relationship with the nature of agency? What are you advocating for? Next one is going to be unconditional love. And here's the thing. Every single one of these words are going to hit people in different ways. This is one of the ones when I have a conversation with folks that can either make you feel like I have a connection with that, I have a lived experience with that, I know what that looks like, or it can really feel like a trigger. It can feel like a wall just went up. Here's the thing I want you to understand when it comes to unconditional love. The idea of not having a prerequisite or a prequalification is going to be a profoundly important space to going, how do I change when everything is disrupted? What does it look like to love somebody in the midst of their suffering or love somebody in the midst of my pain? These are things where uh, two weeks ago, we could have had a ton of prerequisites for what it looks like to give somebody a phone call and say, hey, how are you doing? Uh, that person, you know, I don't know if I'm still in relationship with them or I don't feel like that's important. All of a sudden, our boundaries and our conditions and our prerequisites have changed dramatically. How many phone calls and text messages have you in the sent in the last two weeks to people you haven't talked to in ages? So I want you to understand, when we talk about unconditional love, this is naturally available to you, but it is not necessarily the lived experience of everybody that has gone through that space. An example of this, just to connect a dot quickly, is when we look at the growth piece and we look at the agency piece and we look at what it looks like to be loved, one of the populations that is profoundly gifted at what it looks like to work through these spaces when you are restricted and when you, do, you don't have agency and somebody does not love you well, look at the last several hundred years of BIPOC populations, black, indigenous, and people of color. If you guys want to see a lived experience of what it looks like to go through profound crisis as a people group, Read anything by ta Hesse Coates. Read anything by Austin Channing Brown. Read anything from your African American and your indigenous authors and see what does it look like when you don't have hope? What does it look like when you don't have resources? We've got to think outside of our boxes in terms of what we're looking at to make ourselves into something that is going to be resilient in these spaces. And sometimes if you don't feel like you have love, what does it look like to connect with a space that might provide that to you? And fortunately with the way that our brains work through mirror neurons, as I breathe, and all of you remember to breathe, even if it's not in front of us, even if it's virtual, even if it's in a book or an audio book or online, our brain is still to a degree going to believe that we're in that experience. So what does it look like for you to shift from the news station to maybe looking up a video with a little bit of levity and a little bit of lightness, okay? Next, we're looking at the idea of confidence. How many of us are struggling with confidence right now? It's like, I have no idea what it looks like to be confident. There's a huge difference, and we'll talk about the difference between courage in just a second, but confidence does not have a prerequisite of fear. Confidence is saying, I have a gift that I turned into a skill. All of the numbers that I'm, all of the words that I'm talking to you about right now are a natural gift that you have in you. It does not mean it's a skill. If it's a gift that you have honed and you have worked on and you have exercised and it's a muscle that you have developed physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally, or if it applies to you spiritually, then you are able to move into that skill confidently. But here's the thing that I want you to think about as you're working through the spaces that you're in. Each one of these words, if you look at the root word, actually gives you some insight into how to move it from a noun to a verb. Confidence is a noun. To confide in a confidant is an action step with a verb. So most of the time, if you look at somebody who has confidence, if they're really honest, most of my folks who are high in confidence, they struggle with self-doubt tremendously. Confidence can be feigned. 
one of the ways that you can exercise and practice what it looks like to, to regain some sense of orientation to what level of confidence you have, what skills you believe you still carry and you can utilize, is in the lack of confidence or the relative relationship that you have with confidence, find a confidant that you can confide in. Be vulnerable and transparent with that person. Let them know what your fear is and have that cathartic experience. Because clinically speaking, from a medical standpoint, catharsis is when somebody is impacted with feces and you actually have to go in and pull that out because it's toxic. So if you share what your fear is right now with somebody in a safe way and you are in a woundable place, which the root word for vulnerability, vulnera, means to be woundable, if you're sharing that in a woundable place and somebody holds that space with safety, and you get that out of your system, you're actually purging that toxic thought or that toxic emotion, and it will physiologically change the way that your body works and give you a little bit of lightness. So look, see what it looks like to confide in someone in a safe way. Next, compassion. Wow, like this word. Can we think for a second, what better opportunity have we had to exercise compassion to our spouse or our partner or our kids or our coworkers or ourselves? The big compassion of what the world is suffering through, what our communities and our local houses are suffering through. Like one of the funny things that my older brother did who's a pastor is he said, if you're struggling with homeschooling, you're struggling with your kids, just text somebody what your kids did but replace kids with coworkers and it makes for a really entertaining experience to tell somebody what your coworkers did. My brother's co-workers locked themselves out of the house last week and they were trying to bang on the door and he didn't notice for like 10 minutes. So, co-workers. But the reason I say that with compassion is compassion means to suffer with. And the thing that I want you to think through here is there's a very big difference between compassion and fixing it, okay? Compassion is saying, I don't have a solution for you. I don't have a comprehensive answer. I don't know what the outcome looks like but I know what it looks like to sit in solidarity with you, even if it's on the other side of the planet, through a digital conversation and say, I see you, and I'm sorry that this hurts, and I recognize that you're going through things that are painful, and I'm not gonna patronize you or be trivializing what you're experiencing or minimize it enough to think that I can give you a comprehensive answer that will resolve this for you, but I do simply wanna acknowledge how much you're going through, and that is real, and that's compassion. Don't forget to do it for yourself, even looking in the mirror and going, man, today is hard. Today is really, really hard. The next one. Take a deep breath. We're doing okay. Three words left. Hope I'm doing okay on time, Blake. Um, the next word is insight. And insight sounds like a funny thing right now because it's like I can't even see, or cl see clearly. My brain fog, the fog of the experiences that I'm going through, I don't know what it looks like to see in a distance. Take a step back and think for a second. If you were driving in a car, like we're in Atlanta right now, and it's going to be a really nice day, thank God, because my number one trigger is barometric pressure change with rain. It, it creates a real significant issue for me, and that's what triggers migraines. And today's one of those days where I'm like, thank you, Jesus, that it showed up sunny for me to do this talk because I don't have to fight through the same degree of effort. But if you're thinking through a storm or you're thinking through a day where you have a significant amount of fog, how do you reflexively adjust to driving the car when you are in a fog where you can barely see the front of the car? Do you take the same approach? You shouldn't, but do you take the same approach that you have when it's a clear day and you can see for miles? Of course not. There's no practical way to effectively and safely maneuver through the world if you are in a fog. A lot of us are in a fog at the moment. So adjust and understand that because you've had to adjust to the environment and the weather around you does not mean that you are deficient, that you are broken, that you are not working properly, that you have made a mistake. You cannot control the weather. Okay, you can only control your response to the weather. So as we go through the current climate and the current environment that we're in, if you are in a fog, see what it looks like to just get in the car and orient to the environment that you're in. And maybe your goal is to sit parked and take a couple of deep breaths instead of trying to race into the next conversation because you might drive off an unfinished bridge because you don't know where you are. Take a deep breath, step back, and remember even in these kind of environments, I don't know if you guys have seen the, the, the meme or the story that's been going around, but Isaac Newton was quarantined, he couldn't teach, and during the time of the bubonic plague, he came up with a theory of gravity and calculus. Like when we talk about going, what are new ideas that I can come up with? What's a new way of seeing the world in the midst of this conversation? What insights might come to me if I step back and be curious? And here's the thing, there is a very big difference between curiosity and skepticism pragmatism and pessimism. 
My older brother has a great quote, Carl, that says, curiosity is the antidote to fear. We're dealing with a lot of fear. If you're curious, there's a possibility that you don't know the answer, but you're willing to ask the question, but you're not doing it from a place of skepticism that says everything is going to go to hell in a handbasket. You don't know that. As much as you don't know it's going to work out, you don't know it won't. So skepticism is different than curiosity. Ask questions, especially clarifying questions, and see what comes up for you. Next, courage. Here's the thing. I have been fascinated in learning how the brain works and how we deal with fear and anxiety. And for what it's worth right now, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is on the Instagram page that I have, dr.jerome, D-O-C-T-O-R dot Jerome. I'm giving away the Neurotheology of Self-Care course that I have for free. You can register there. It's talking through bigger conversations around how does your body react to fear? How does it react to anxiety? How does it process reality versus perception? But I need you to understand, as a human being, 100% of what your brain does on a daily basis first is assumes whatever you encountered every single time, it has to have a survival-based response. Will I survive? If it knows that there's not a threat, it says, how safe am I? If it knows that you're safe, it says, how can I reduce my pain and increase my pleasurable experiences? And all of that happens subconsciously. So if you're of the mindset that you're like, I don't have fear, one, neurologically it's not possible. Two, if you're like, I have so much fear, I don't know how to deal with it. Neurologically, that is understandable, especially with the state of the environment that we're in. But with courage, fear is a prerequisite for courage. It does not take any courage to move into a space that is not uncomfortable. It doesn't take any courage to move into a space that does not have fear. That is confidence. You've got the skill that you've honed through the gift that you can use to effectively work through the environment. If you don't know how it's gonna work out and you're not sure what the next step is and you don't know how to get all of the resources to effectively work through the environment that you're in and you have to step into it anyways, that is being courageous. And think about it, the whole point of this conversation, thanks to Blake for giving me literally the hardest talk Creative Mornings has ever had. We're in the middle of a pandemic and it's the first time that we're streaming and I'm trying to encourage you guys in less than 30 minutes. <laughs> but think about the word encouragement. E-N is to put into or to place in. Courage. To encourage someone is to literally instill in them the opportunity to say, you can do this. Encouragement doesn't mitigate fear. Encouragement allows you to know, even with the fear present, you still can move forward, okay? Last thing, inspiration. <sighs> inspiration is literally what I just did, to inspire. So if you watch somebody that inspires you, we know a lot of people that are gifted in the Atlanta community and the global community that are so inspirational. The thing that I want to really point out in this space is I don't want to give you some sort of emotional band-aid in the midst of a triage situation. I want to give you something that allows you to consistently catch your breath. If you are breathing in, it is life-giving. I don't want to give you an inspirational talk that you forget this afternoon or tomorrow. I want to be able to give you something that says I can consistently come back to my own breath, which is life-giving, and be inspired without any outside resources. But the gift of inspiration is the last time that you sat back and went, man, this is actually, this is exciting, this is working. What can I be enthusiastic about? What can I do that would be exciting? What does it look like for me to sit at my house this morning at 7 a.m. and see, man, because this is the nature of the environment that we're in. This is really hard. Anybody who's a leader, anybody who's having a conversation with you that says they're not wrestling through things is in denial or is disassociated from their own feelings. I'm sitting at the house at seven o'clock this morning watching my four-year-old and my two-year-old, and we have a third one on the way, just dancing all over the house. They're playing this song over and over and over again, uh, which is Stupid Love by Lady Gaga. And my four-year-old and my two-year-old are just dancing. They're excited and they're enthusiastic and they're full of life and they're hyperventilating and they're doing all of these things. And I'm sitting there going, I have to give a talk in two hours to try and encourage the community at, at large in what can we do to survive today? What can we do to thrive down the road when everything settles? And I'm looking at my kids and going, they're inspired. They're breathing in the world because that part of us is still available because here's a caveat. Every time that you are afraid, every time that you get nervous, every time you get anxious, Bruce Banner switches gears and hands the baton to the Hulk, 
when you have a survival-based response, the seven-year-old version of you just got in the driver's seat. So if you take a deep breath, the CEO steps back into the driver's seat and you have a sense of control. But the beautiful thing, when you are in a fearful place, a seven-year-old takes over. But when you are in a hopeful and excited place, think about the seven-year-old version of you who is not as concerned as you are right now. They're a little bit more lighthearted. So inspiration is available, but if you don't know what it looks like to be inspired right now, to find something that gives you life, the one thing that you can absolutely do right now is take a breath. Even if we are in a situation where we are dealing with a respiratory issue sweeping the planet, whatever version of a breath that you can take, if you choose to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, and swallow at the end of the exhale, you're gonna do what's called a vagal exercise, V-A-G-A-L, and a polyvagal exercise helps you to activate your rest and digest system, which is the antidote to fear. So if you do this with me, Swallow, one more time. Two breaths. How much of a difference does it make to your body? The tension in your shoulders, the chance to let go of some of the fear. Because it's real, it's okay to be uncomfortable. We have to be able to be so skilled at celebrating the wins at the same time as we carry other people's pain. This is not something that we can just band-aid and cover up and sweep under the rug. This is a legitimate opportunity for us as a species to look at our possible first encounter with our own mortality and go, what does it look like for me to do something with my life in the moment that I have? Because I know, I don't know if I've ever encountered something like this before but what does it look like for you to encounter or check in with somebody that does know what it's like to have a life-threatening experience? The reason I get a little bit emotional in some of these spaces is because you're talking to somebody who has had a suicide attempt and survived it. And, man, that was pre-kids. And the space of being able to be hopeful when you've been in a space where you're willing to check out entirely, which, let's be honest, there's a lot of people right now that are that scared, and that is totally okay. That is understandable. I want to under, reiterate the first part of this. This is not about being less broken. It's about becoming whole, and if you're in a place where you feel broken and you're struggling, reach out. Jamie Torkowski and to write love on her arms and you make today better.com is a great resource for saying, how can I reach out? All of those people are still available for you to connect with. But I want us to just take a deep breath and know that in the midst of all these spaces, there is still something that we can hang on to if the only thing is a deep breath. Okay. But like, do I have time to go through the two questions at the end? Is that okay? Okay. I just want to make sure. So I should be my confidence monitor. I forgot. I got four slides left. I apologize. So this is a picture that we refer to affectionately as Pangea, okay? All the words that I just went through for you, growth, rest, agency, unconditional love, confidence, compassion, insight, courage, and inspiration. I want you to think of this as a global map. And you see how there's three continents and those continents are separated like they're broken. We look at the world that we're in right now and we keep having this metaphorical desire to be Pangea again. It's never gonna happen. We have seven continents that are separated for a reason because tectonic shifts happen. You are in a place where you have had such a significant shift in your life, they may never come back together. But understand, when the travel bans are lifted and when things are changed, we can physically travel all over the world. People have gone to every corner of the planet. Originally, they thought it was flat. Originally, they thought they couldn't. Originally, they thought people were crazy for traveling west. But now, 2020, how many of us think it's weird to get on a plane and go to a different continent? It's not. In the midst of the space that we're in right now, we can even do it virtually. So the point that I'm making with that metaphor is you can, in fact, go all over the planet digitally, virtually, and from your own experience as a human being. So when you see this, first and foremost, just credit where credit is due. This beautiful artwork and the artwork that's in the book, the brain-based Enneagram, was done by Amy Strickland, who is local in Atlanta, and she is profoundly gifted. Because how many of you are looking at that going, that's real nice, that's real nice. And all of the copy in the book that was written, credit to Tiffany Berkowitz. She takes when I normally get verbose, like I am right now, and I run a little long-winded, she helps me to distill it. So those two ladies have literally made this work possible. 
So what does this mean? How do you make it practical? So take the same image, the entire global experience of who you are, all of the gifts that are available to you, and look at this next picture. The next picture, what I am saying to you, literally, is all nine of the numbers on the Enneagram overlay directly on top of how your brain is actually made. If you take the head triad, it correlates with the left brain, the heart triad is the right brain, and then the gut triad is the brainstem or the subconscious function of a human being. For the sake of time, I am not gonna unpack that for you. There are so many resources. But the point of this talk is to say you are not a number. The reason that this is really important is the primary thing that we are looking for in these spaces right now is to understand how in the world do I manage what I am currently wrestling with. This is a juggling act of epic proportions that we are not familiar with because it is not practiced for us. So your normal resources may not be sufficient. But what if somebody showed up and said, hey, you've got all of these other gifts that you have access to. Take a deep breath and see what it looks like to access compassion if you're not used to it. Agency if you're not used to it. Courage if you're not used to it. You may be well exercised in one of those nine words or a couple of them and you're like, man, that's easy for me. But what does it look like to know that the other ones are available and you can engage? Because I promise you, just as much as the science proves that you got to go over the top, not from the bottom, you can, in fact, access all of these easily, okay? So here's a practical, two practical questions to finish. The, this question that's up on the board is to remember when you go through each of these words and you orient to those spaces, how does it apply to you internally, yourself? How does it apply to those that are within reach that can directly impact you now? Even if it's on the phone and they're a country away or a continent away, but they call you and they say, man, I would love to talk and that would impact you. How does it impact everybody else that's out of reach, somebody that doesn't normally come into your sphere of influence? If you change the subject, it will profoundly change the meaning of the word. And the last one, just like a workout, some of the things that we can consider as we figure out, okay, this word I got a lot of skill and strength in. This word I don't necessarily exercise on a regular basis. If you are going to start exercising or continue exercising in a space, it's important to know, is this a high weight exercise? Is it something where it's gonna be really intense and, and I've gotta lift this one weight of being transparent with my spouse or my partner because I don't know what it looks like to tell them that I'm terrified? That's a heavy weight exercise. You're not gonna do that in a high rep situation. That's intense. So ask yourself, how strong do I need to be in this situation? How strong does my response need to be? When you're looking at frequency, is this a high rep situation? How often do I need to be doing it? If this is not something where I get up at eight o'clock every morning, Blake asked earlier, are you an early riser? He looked at 9.15 and he goes, most of you are early risers. If I woke up at nine o'clock, that is like three, three in the afternoon. I have no idea what nine o'clock looks like for early. My early is five. But what about for you if nine is early? What does it look like to get up at 8.30 for three out of five days in the week? Or three out of seven days in the full week versus a work week? So when you look at the frequency, just ask yourself for your particular lived experience in your relative space, how often do you need to do this? And the last one, duration. Right now, it's safe to say for all of us in this space, this is probably gonna be a marathon. It's not gonna be a sprint. So if we know and we have that healthy expectation that this will not resolve next week, I don't care who you are and how fast you want the economy to open again. It's going to take time, period. We have to be practical and have a healthy expectation about saying, if this is a marathon, you have to train and equip yourself differently. If you try to do a marathon at sprint speed, you will not make it. So understand the length of it, be realistic about that. And if it takes a long time, see what it looks like to enjoy, enjoy the journey. Okay. So the last point that I want to make that we've done a couple of times is throughout the entire conversation, whatever stuck for you, whatever made sense for you. At the end of the day, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what your circumstances are. But I do know if you are above ground and you are still breathing, you can take one deep breath. Keep coming back to that. Be present in your body. Choose to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, and swallow at the end of the exhale. And if that is the only thing that you walk away from, I promise you are having some degree of healthy leadership step back into the midst of your challenging spaces. That's it. Sorry I went over. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Virtual Just distance. <laughs> Air boom. We're going to do Q&A now, and we've got one of our team members texting me questions that pop up in the chat box. So we might have to wait a minute because there's a little bit of a delay. 
but then I'll ask the questions. I'll be your like uh, avatar in real life, virtual question asker. For and we're trying to practice social distance here as well, so it's that's like three feet. So that's pretty good. There you go. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. By My the way, pleasure, while we man. wait, thank I appreciate you for the opportunity. Your, your wisdom and your vulnerability. Yeah. The chat room was blowing up. Right on. Which I love <laughs> being a part of the chat room. It took me back to AOL days, like yeah. the original internet, man. Man, it dude, just we got wild. our we got our first computer when we were 14, which was 20 years ago. I still every time I hear the dial up. Part of me gets a little bit anxious because I don't want my mom to step into the room when I'm doing something inappropriate. Oh, yeah. And then you the rest of me is like, room. the rest of me is, the rest of me is like, man, it's funny how cool that sound is, and you're like, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> All right, let's see if I've got any questions. Okay, here's one from Tim Del Risco. Yeah. Who says, was there something specific that brought you out of a place of hopelessness to where you are now? Mm. Let's go with the hard question right up front. <laughs> um, yeah, the the biggest thing is. When it brought me out of a place of hope, hopelessness, I want you to think about if you feel like you're drowning, you're actively not trying to keep your head above water, you're underwater. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was allowing people in to allow myself to see community. Sometimes you can actively extend a hand and sometimes you can't even get a hand above water because you're not there. But I think the question is, is ask yourself what your relationship is with fighting and defending against those who might be stepping in and trying to check on you. Um, honestly, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to be dismissive and make this, this trivialized, but if no one is trying to connect with you and there is no one that is trying to reach out to you, then it's going to take an active effort on your part to try and get your head above water and orient. But in my particular situation, I was gifted and fortunate to have, Ooh, let's see if I can get through it. I was gifted and fortunate enough to have incredible family, an incredible spouse and an incredible partner. Um, and people who were like, Hey man, uh, we love that you love people so well, but you don't set good boundaries and you don't say no often enough. Will you let us do something like take you to dinner? Will you let us do something like maybe put the kids to bed? Will, we, will you let us do something like maybe do your laundry for you or, or call your executive assistant and plan a day off for you because you won't do it? Um, so I think the answer for me was, long story short, I had to allow myself back into community even if it felt like the version of me wasn't wanted. Mm, that's good. All right, let's see. Thomas Wilson says, is it possible to shift your results, default brain responses, or do we just add to our toolkits by exercising the others? Yeah, it's a great question. And I love that somebody put that because there's a technical term in neurology called a default mode network. Basically, it's a protocol that shows up in your system that says, kind of like an immune response, this happened in my past based on the survival strategies and the protocols that I have. I have. What is the most likely way that I'll respond that'll actually keep me alive? So I want you to realize the neuroplasticity and the way that the brain works, fortunately, you have natural hardware that is hardwired that you came out of the factory with. Everybody's is different. It's pretty similar, but slightly different in terms of manufacturing. But your software is open source. The way that your brain works is you can actually go in, and they've shown this specifically through meditation is the example that I'll give you. Google through really good research journals and like Google Scholar and, 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 and all sorts of other research journals that are available to, to catalog what's available. And just Google meditation and gene code or RNA DNA transcription change. And they actually show through meditation and mindfulness practices being able to stop intentionally take a deep breath, you can actually change your genetic code, literally. That is science. That's not, that's not a hypothesis. That's proven. So when we look at default mode networks, I need you to understand your open source software is powerful enough that not only can you change your code, but the code can actually remanufacture the hardware in real time. We are not mechanical. We're organic. So think about being in a manufacturing plant that as the order comes in, it literally changes the blueprint and it starts producing different hardware in the midst of the software update. So the bottom line is neuroplasticity, you can 100% change it. What happens that needs to change that is a combination of intensity, frequency, and duration. If you have a profoundly intense moment, like something of profound love, like a child being born, or profound suffering, like a trauma, it'll change it immediately. Where were we when 9-11 happened? when the Challenger blew up, when JFK was assassinated, when we realized, I am gonna have to stay at home. This is real. These things are significant events, so sometimes you can have that change immediately based on the intensity. Most of the time, especially as we get back into a normal life, and we will eventually, the, the human race has survived this for a long time, the majority of the way that it's changed is actually based on how frequently you engage 
and how long that engagement is for. Because the phrase that I would use for, for you is not pra practice makes perfect. It's actually not true. It's practice makes permanent. The question is, what are you practicing? Mm. Okay. Wow, that's good. All right, let's do a couple more here. Let's see. Lisa Maloof, I hope I said that right. Where can I find a place to figure out what Enneagram I am? Sure. Um, there are so many good resources. My personal preference is I do two schools of, two schools of thought or tradition. Um, the narrative Enneagram, uh, which is Helen Palmer and David Daniels, and also the Enneagram Institute, which is Russ Hudson. Those two combined, a really, really easy book to approach that's very digestible is The Essential Enneagram by David Daniels. But if you're gonna take a test, remember a test is not a diagnosis. Me as a clinician, if somebody comes in with a lab value or they come in with a test, that is informative diagnostics, not a diagnosis. So when you take a test and it gives you the results, what you need to do is go to somebody who is credentialed and is a, actually a certified coach in the Enneagram and say, these are my results, can you help me make sense of them? Just like you would a clinician and saying, I wanna be a healthier version of myself, how can we use this information? And it's a combination of knowing your own personal lived experiences and history, relative real-time recent results in terms of a test at the Enneagram Institute. You can take the RHETI ready or the IVQ. Those are both really, really good tests. And then you leverage that information with somebody who's trained in it and try to comprehensively come up with a game plan. Great. All right, that was awesome. All right, let's see here. Matt Kaufman, could you argue compassion precedes encouragement, which then inspires? and further build a network of caring? Well, that's a great question, Matt. And I actually, I appreciate the nuance of the question and I would agree with you. Uh, there, generally speaking, this is where the idea of zeal without wisdom comes into mind for me. Uh, it is great to be excitable. Um, it is not gonna help anybody feel better to encourage them if they've jumped out of an airplane and they don't have a parachute on, okay? You need to be able to sit with somebody. And I joke around with folks, my background is in Judeo-Christianity, but all of my work is across all face sets. But Job's friends, the best work that they probably did was in the time where they didn't open their mouth before they started talking. Uh, so I do think sometimes in the situation, in the context, the exception is I think you can combine encouragement and you can combine compassion by offering levity because levity neuters pain without trying to fix it for somebody. It doesn't mean that you just act ridiculous, but I promise you my older brother and my twin brother who are very efficient in seven energy have kept me on the planet because of some very, very good laughs and good opportunities to connect with what it feels like to be lighthearted. And sometimes that gives you encouragement when you can actually get your head above water. So I think humor and levity is a great way to neuter pain. But the reason that somebody's able to use levity is because they were compassionate enough to recognize that there was pain present and the levity needed to be there as a resource. So a little bit of both hand. Great, love it. And you were able to say the word neuter twice just then. Did I? You did, right which on. is good. I, I try to sneak that into as many conversations as many as times as you can. Okay, last, last question really here is, <laughs> Uh, a lot of people are asking, is there a web page where we could get a list of all of the people, resources you mentioned during this talk? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a pretty good memory, so even without going back and looking at the video, I will post it on my Instagram page. Perfect. And I can do that, and I can also send it to, to Blake. Uh, the other thing, if you're okay with it, I'm putting them on the spot, but I'll share my PowerPoint. Oh, it's actually a keynote, sorry. Um, I'll share my keynote with everybody and the artwork and you can connect with that and I'll put a list of resources together. Um, there's also a couple of other videos I've done if anybody connected with the idea of what's happening with the despair piece uh, where I did a talk a couple of months ago called Everything is Not Fine uh, and it was specifically about mental and emotional health, suicidality in these different spaces when we're in the midst of really challenging spaces. So I'll put together over the weekend a, a compilation of resources. I'll get it to Blake and he can send it out to everybody that registered. Is that cool? Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. All right, everyone, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will do this again next month in April with Shaniqua Gay. We hope to see you there. Please give us some feedback. We'll send out the survey as we always do. Let us know how we could do a live stream better, but we appreciate all of you and we want you to wash your hands, stay at home, stay safe, Go and hope over. you'll join us next time. Go under, over. Under, under. Every time. Feel it from your heart, not science. Your body will tell you what's true. As soon as you go under, it's gonna feel weird. Go, okay. Okay, we're done. Thanks. And we're out. <laughs>